Chris, I was looking forward to talking to you this morning, and it stuck with me what Brett said there when he was reacting to the news uh, yesterday evening. And I was going to ask you, he said, diehard Democrats, uh, this will put them at ease, this choice. Do you see it that way? Yeah, I think so. Uh, she did not do very well in the Democratic primaries, but that's for a variety of reasons. She didn't run a, a great campaign. But, you know, she is not far to the left, despite what uh, Republicans are going to try to say. She, there is a, a certain uh, circuitous route to her position on issues. Uh, she was for Medicare for all before she was against it. But, uh, you know, I think, I think she's a reasonably safe choice. Uh, she was the obvious front runner. She was the obvious choice. She adds some excitement to the ticket. She's a statement to uh, African Americans and especially to African American women who are the real solid core of the Democratic Party that the party does not take them for granted. Uh, and, and so I think, I think she's a, a pretty safe choice and will energize some women, energize some African Americans. And most importantly, it's a cliche, but it's true, like the Hippocratic Oath, what people always say about the vice presidential pick is first, do no harm. And at least at first, we'll see what happens over the next 80 some days, she doesn't do any harm to the Biden chances to be elected president. The president's been all over this. You've seen his reaction. He tweeted this, uh, Kamala Harris started strong in the Dem primaries and finished weak, ultimately fleeing the race with almost zero support. That's the kind of opponent everyone dreams of. So how do you see the Trump campaign formulating their strategy to combat this ticket? Well, look, let, again, in the end, after a couple of weeks, uh, this is going to be about Trump and Biden, not about the running mates. It never is. Uh, but, you know, despite the president saying yesterday that Kamala Harris was his number one draft pick, that's the one he wanted the most, I promise you that there are a lot of people he would have liked to be running against what's worse. Again, think what would have happened if Susan Rice had been the nominee. Think uh, what would have happened if it had been Elizabeth Warren. Think what would have happened if it had been Karen Bass with her long history uh, of service in, uh, and, and interest and support for the Castro regime in Cuba. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing, but I, I think it's fair to say that in the year 2020 for Joe Biden in this current situation with all of the talk uh, particularly about race and racial injustice in America, that to pick a woman who was the, the daughter of an immigrant from India and a daughter of an immigrant from Jamaica was the safe choice for Joe Biden. For all the president's talk about the idea that, that uh, Biden is kind of an empty vessel and uh, that this is a political living will and she's a far lefter, I mean, she was a prosecutor in San Francisco mm -hmm. and then the attorney general of California and, in fact, lost points during the Democratic primaries because of the fact that, that she was pretty tough on crime and she supported the death penalty, even though personally she's against it. That's going to make it a little bit harder for the Republicans to say that, you know, this is a far left defund the police ticket. Again, think of who he could have chosen and how much easier it would have been for Republicans to make that case. The truth is that as much as the Republican Party pretends to have been prepared for or pleased at the prospect of Kamala Harris appearing on the Democratic ticket, their attacks are proof that they weren't. The White House has already released its opposition research on Kamala Harris, and if you thought their attacks on Biden were a reach, then I really hope you're sitting down. They've suggested that she supports open borders, which not only does she not support, but no one in the Democratic Party supports. They've suggested her stance on health care is that she wants, quote, social Socialized healthcare. In reality, her plan kept a significant role for health insurance companies by allowing people to choose private plans modeled on Medicare Advantage. They've suggested she's, quote, anti-energy and climate because she's against fracking, which is ironic considering fracking itself is bad for the climate. Fracking releases methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, and has been a major contributor to methane being released into the atmosphere over the last decade. So claiming she's anti-climate because she's opposed to fracking is like claiming she's anti-health because she opposes smoking. They they try the usual BS socialist talking points by pointing out that she's for higher taxes. But guess what? The latest polling shows that about two thirds of all Americans also favor higher taxes for the wealthiest Americans. And it just so happens that those not calling for higher taxes are Republicans kowtowing to the rich donors. This is an 
isn't painting Kamala Harris in a negative light, it's just painting the GOP as being exactly as out of touch as they are. And finally, my favorite is their attacks on Kamala as anti-Catholic because she prosecuted a pro-life Republican operative who had posed as a journalist and illegally recorded a conversation with Planned Parenthood officials before deceptively editing the video to make it look like they were selling harvested baby parts. And so because that operative was pro-life, then Kamala Harris is anti-Catholic. Apparently, if you rightfully prosecute anyone who's pro-life, then you're automatically anti-Catholic. Good news for all those murderers out there. As long as you're Catholic, Republicans think you should have carte blanche to do anything you want, because otherwise we may come across as hating your religion. Got it. But it's not even the Republicans' misrepresentation on her issues, it's the audacity of those people to attack anyone on those issues. On healthcare, the Trump administration is in court as we speak trying to destroy the ACA, in the middle of a pandemic. On climate, this administration has done zero, literally zero, to address the greatest existential crisis that humanity faces in climate change. They've reversed every Obama-era policy they could get their hands on, pulled the US out of the Paris Climate Agreement, reversed fuel efficiency standards, and are still propping up a a dying coal industry and surrendering our ability to lead on renewable manufacturing to other countries. On taxation, the White House passed a monumentally unpopular tax bill that only served to help big corporations and the ultra wealthy. And on religion, this is a president who has exploited religion to an almost embarrassing degree. Donald Trump isn't religious, he doesn't go to church, he cheated on his pregnant wife with models and porn stars who he then used campaign funds to pay off, he's bragged about committing sexual assault, and he's likely never read a word of the Bible. You want an idea of Trump's religiousness? You mentioned the Bible. You've been talking about how it's your favorite book. And you said, I think last night in Iowa, some people are surprised that you say that. I'm wondering what one or two of your most favorite Bible uh, verses are well, and why. I, I wouldn't want to get into it because to me that's very personal. You know, when I talk about the Bible, it's very personal. So I don't want to get into there's verses. No, there's I don't no want to get into it. There's no, no verse I, that I, means I a just, lot to you that you think about or cite. The, the Bible means a lot to me, but I don't want to get into specifics even to cite a verse that no, you like. No, I don't want to do that. Are you an Old Testament guy or a New Testament guy? Uh, probably equal. I think it's just an incredible, the whole Bible is an incredible, I joke uh, very much so. They always hold up the art of the deal. I say my second favorite book of all time. But uh, I just think the Bible is just something very special. The fact is that Trump and Republicans can throw out these tired attacks, but the reason they fall flat is because none of them are based in reality. And what's worse, Trump himself is worse off on all of these issues than his Democratic counterparts. And the fact that even Fox News is able to acknowledge this with zero hesitation is a testament to just how much the White House is crumbling right now. And don't forget to listen to my podcast, No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen, where I'll take a deep dive into the biggest issues of the week and interview major players in the world of politics, like Adam Schiff, Nancy Pelosi, Beto O'Rourke, Eric Swalwell, Katie Porter, and many more. Again, that's No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen, available anywhere you listen to podcasts.